Here I shall discuss the latest guidelines on diagnosis and management of thalassemia in children as given by the Thalassemia International Federation this year itself. This is the first part covering half of the guidelines. So just to recapitulate, hemoglobin as we know is a tetrameric protein with four globin polypeptide chains each associated with an iron protoporphyrin 9 group called as heme. The fetal hemoglobin or hemoglobin F is comprised of alpha 2, gamma 2 which by the age of 6 months is replaced to quite an extent by alpha 2, beta 2 that is hemoglobin A. This is present along with alpha 2, delta 2 that is hemoglobin A2. So the composition of hemoglobin in a normal adult is hemoglobin A up to 95 to 98% hemoglobin A2 2 to 3 percent and hemoglobin F 0.8 to 2 percent. Now hemoglobinopathies or diseases of hemoglobin per se can be quantitative defects related to the number of globin chains or qualitative defects related to the quality of a globin chain. Here I shall be talking about beta thalassemia which is the most common type of thalassemia which is seen in India. So while normal hemoglobin is alpha 2 beta 2 there can be no production of beta chains that is alpha 2 beta 0 when alpha chains accumulate inside the RBC and produce symptoms or alpha 2 beta plus plus or alpha 2 beta plus when partial number of beta chains are produced. It has an autosomal recessive inheritance. The beta globin gene cluster is located on the short arm of chromosome 11 that is 11p 15.5 locus. And hemoglobin E is a beta hemoglobin variant due to another point mutation in beta chain at position 26 and presents as a milder form of beta thalassemia itself. Some qualitative defects in the hemoglobin molecule are hemoglobin S where valine replaces amino acid glutamine at the 6th position of beta globin gene. Hemoglobin C where lysine replaces amino acid glutamine at 6th position of beta globin gene. Hemoglobin D which is a group of 16 beta chain variants and hemoglobin G which is a group of 6 alpha chain variants. Now what happens when two different types of abnormal hemoglobins are in co-inherited? When alpha thalassemia is co-inherited with beta thalassemia, there is a decreased severity of the clinical presentation of beta thalassemia. Whereas if there is alpha triplication or quadruplication, then there is increased severity of beta thalassemia because we know that symptoms in beta thalassemia are majorly because of the accumulation of the alpha chains in place of the beta chains. Co-inheritance of hemoglobin E with beta thalassemia is called as hemoglobin E beta and it is the most common severe form of beta thalassemia in Asia. Hemoglobin C co-inheritance causes moderate hemolytic anemia. Sickle beta thalassemia has an autosomal recessive inheritance. The clinical features depend on the amount of hemoglobin A. HBS beta 0 presents as Sickle cell anemia itself since there is almost no hemoglobin A and HBS beta plus presents as moderate anemia with less severe signs of sickle cell disease. Whatever the type of sickle cell beta thalassemia be there, hemoglobin S predominates on electrophoresis and it is almost always more than 50%. Supportive treatment is the mainstay of therapy depending on the symptoms. Now there is a phenotypic classification based on the clinical severity and transfusion requirement. If the transfusions are occasional or intermittent then it is referred to as non-transfusion dependent thalassemia clinical phenotype and the types of thalassemia included are mild HBE beta thalassemia, HBC beta thalassemia, deletional HBH, moderate HBE beta thalassemia. And if the transfusion requirement is regular or lifelong, then the phenotype is referred to as transfusion dependent thalassemia and the varieties included are non-deletional HBH, beta thalassemia major, severe HBE beta thalassemia. Now the first recommendation which the Thalassemia International Federation has made is that in any case of microcytic hypochromic anemia, a diagnosis of thalassemia and iron deficiency should always be considered. So the basic tests we do are 
hemoglobin which is low mcv mch mchc that is rbc indices which are also low and rbc count which is increased in thalassemia though decreased in iron deficiency anemia red cell distribution width which is normal or near normal in thalassemia and increased in iron deficiency anemia and menzel's index is a calculated value by the formula mcv upon rbc count it is less than 13 in thalassemia and more than 13 in iron deficiency anemia so the three basic screening tests which help us to differentiate between thalassemia and iron deficiency is rbc count and rdw menzel's index is a derived value the problem arises when iron deficiency coexists with thalassemia which is most of the case so seen in india but for confirmation of thalassemia, we need to do a high performance liquid chromatography test or a capillary zone electrophoresis in which we quantitate hemoglobin F percentage and hemoglobin A2 percentage. An alpha gene triplication or quadruplication should be taken into consideration in heterozygous beta thalassemia patients with thalassemia intermediate phenotype, as I had already discussed in the previous slide. So, the screening sets. Tests and HPLC are sufficient to diagnose beta thalassemia, but we may sometimes want to do genetic testing also. For example, in recently and or continuously transfused patients where high performance liquid chromatography is not possible. Because we know that the normal lifespan of RBCs is 100 to 120 days, that is we will have to wait for 3 to 4 months then after transfusion to do the HPLC test where both parents are beta thalassemia trait but other differential diagnosis cannot be ruled out completely for example suspected congenital dyserythropoietic anemia inherited bone marrow failure syndromes juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia etc the clinical phenotype is not in congruence with the hplc findings and for prenatal diagnosis in couples who are at risk of conceiving a thalassemic child the various tests available are Sanger sequencing or automated DNA sequencing, PCR based amplification refractory mutation system, reverse dot plot hybridization assay, denaturing gradient gel electrophoresis and confirmation sensitive gel electrophoresis, gap PCR or multiplex ligation dependent probe assay to detect al deletional alpha thalassemias. Now for prenatal diagnosis, we perform a chorionic villus biopsy at 10 to 14 weeks of gestational age. This is the fetal sample of choice. The risk of pregnancy or limb loss associated with it is only 1 to 2 percent. Amniocentesis at 15 to 18 weeks and this is done using fetal amniocytes as the source of DNA. Chordocentesis is done at more than 18 weeks of gestation using the fetal blood as the sample. Non-invasive prenatal diagnosis or NIPD using fetal cells or cell-free fetal DNA from maternal blood during pregnancy and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis whereby in vitro selection of unaffected embryos or gametes is done before pregnancy. For blood transfusion, informed consent, hemovigilance and adverse events reporting is the main key. One must favor voluntary, regular, non-remunerated blood donors at the time of first transfusion an extended red cell antigen typing of the patients for d c c e e and kel if available should be done and preferably a full red cell phenogenotype should be done including antibodies to e c and anti kel allo antibodies at each subsequent transfusion we must give abo rh compatible blood and blood should preferably be matched for C, E and KEL antigens also. Before each transfusion, one must perform a screening for new antibodies which might have developed due to a previous transfusion. And for this, we do an indirect antiglobulin or co indirect Combs test for the same. For blood transfusion, leukodepleted packed red cells are to be preferred. And pre storage filtration is preferred to bedside filtration of the RBCs. A cutoff of uh, WBCs less than 1 into 10 to the power 6 is considered to be a critical threshold for leukodepletion. Washed RBCs should be used for patients who have allergic reactions. RBCs stored in CPDA must be transfused within one week of collection, and those in additive solution within two weeks of collection where available. Transfusion should be done every 2 to 
2 to 5 weeks as per the TIF, maintaining pre-transfusion hemoglobin above 9 to 10.5 gram per deciliter or up to 11 to 12 gram per deciliter for patients with cardiac compensation. But remember the Indian studies, they say transfuse every 3 to 4 weeks. We may also have to transfuse every 2 weeks in aging patients or those with cardiac insufficiency because in them the blood requirement increases. One must keep a record of red cell antibodies, transfusion reactions, annual transfusion requirements for each patient to assess the volume of blood required to maintain the desired pre-transfusion hemoglobin and we must aim to keep the post-transfusion hemoglobin to less than 14 to 15 gram per deciliter. The initial transfusion is done if hemoglobin is less than 6 grams per deciliter or the patient has inability to compensate for low hemoglobin like he is having cardiovascular decompensation or increasing signs of ineffective erythropoiesis for example bone changes or massive splenomegaly. Hemoglobin less than 7 grams per deciliter if there is coexistent growth impairment, marked skeletal changes or extra medullary hematopoiesis. Regular transfusions are initiated if hemoglobin drops to less than 7 grams per deciliter on two occasions two weeks apart. These cutoff rates are very important and one must remember them. The transfusion rate is preferably 5 ml per kg per hour and even slower that is 2 ml per kg per hour in those with severe anemia or cardiac compromise along with the use of diuretics to prevent sudden cardiac decompensation. A mandatory screening for HIV, HBV, HCV, malaria and syphilis needs to be done. Nucleic acid testing is optional but still it is desirable because many times these infections can be in the window period. Now we know that iron binding proteins are of two types. Transferrin which binds iron in circulation and ferritin and hemosiderin which binds stored iron. Now iron overload occurs when transferrin saturation occurs. This un the unbound iron called as the non-transferrin bound iron or labile iron is taken up by the tissues depending on the number of calcium channels present in the tissues and that is why the cardiac myocytes are very susceptible and this gets stored as ferritin or hemosiderin in the tissues. This iron generates free radicals in the form of reactive oxygen species and hydroxyl radicals which in turn caused, caused lipid peroxidation and consequent DNA damage and cell death. So iron accumulation leads to symptoms of the organ system involved. For example, cardiomyopathy, liver cirrhosis and endocrinopathies including hypopituitarism, hypogonadism, hypothyroidism, diabetes, osteopenia, short stature, osteoporosis and infertility. In this regard, we must remember that each unit of PRBC delivers approximately 20 mg of iron Iron per ml of blood can be calculated by the formula 1.16 into hematocrit of the blood product being transfused. So a 100 to 200 ml per kg of PRBC transfusion each year shall deliver approximately 116 to 232 milligram per kg of iron per year to a transfusion dependent thalassemic patient. Now liver iron concentration is used to calculate the total body iron. And serum ferritin is also an approximate marker of liver iron concentration. An absolute change in total body iron in response to chelation can be calculated from a change in liver iron concentration. And if we are following serum ferritin for monitoring, then we need to look at trends in serum ferritin. Why? Because we know that serum ferritin is an acute phase reactant. It may be falsely elevated during infection and inflammation and can therefore not always be relied upon accurately. The average LIC values are 1.8 mg per gram dry weight of liver and LIC can be detected using biopsy, superconducting quantum interface device system and MRI. One must initiate chelation therapy after 10 to 15, rather Indian studies suggest 15 to 20 transfusions once they are complete. Serum ferritin more than 1000 micrograms per liter and in a child more than 2 years of age. The purpose is to increase solubility of iron thus facilitating its urinary excretion and the aim is to maintain serum ferritin between 1000 to 2000 micrograms per liter by chelation. Now iron chelation therapy can be of three types that is preventive therapy 
where iron chelation is done before end organ damage. Rescue therapy, when end organ damage has already set in, when we start the iron chelation therapy at the time of starting the therapy. And emergency chelation therapy, when patient in cardiac failure, when patient is in cardiac failure due to iron overload, and we need to immediately reverse the same. So it should be initiated at correct doses and frequency because only then can we balance between achieve a balance between ion excretion and accumulation. Response to chelation is dose and duration dependent. Remember, this is very important. Response is affected by the rate of blood transfusion. Iron accumulates in heart later than the liver and is rare before the age of 8 years. So in young children, we don't see cardiac toxicity per se. Chelation is faster than from the liver than from the myocardium. Chelation can reverse iron-mediated cardiac dysfunction rapidly, but myocardial storage of iron is removed slowly. Overchelation increases side effects from chelation therapy and doses should therefore be decreased as serum ferritin or liver iron levels fall. And chelation therapy will not be effective if it is not taken regularly since it binds to labile iron and hence the compliance needs to be stressed upon the patients. So to summarize, when a patient presents with clinical symptoms of thalassemia or with a history of thalassemia in the family per se, we perform screening tests which include CBC, peripheral blood smear, RBC indices, RBC count and RDW and also calculate the Menzer's index. We confirm our diagnosis with a high performance liquid chromatography or a capillary zone electrophoresis, start blood transfusions after extended red cell phenotyping and monitor the type of PRBC transfused frequency and the rate of transfusions. We initiate iron chelation after 10 to 15 transfusions, serum ferritin more than 1000 micrograms per liter and in a child more than a minimal, minimal age more than 2 years. Thank you for watching and sharing shall benefit everyone. Thank you.